So we're going to just run through a case that we that we do in uh, in property the first year property course. The first year property course uh, is a required course that we teach in the spring here at UVA. Some some uh, law schools teach it in the fall. Some do a year long. Some don't do it till the second year and make it optional. Um, it's one of the basic first year common law courses. Uh, and uh, in my class, at least, we do a range of stuff, uh, um, 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 including the residential real estate transaction, the subprime mortgage crisis of 2008. That's what we did today. We talked about that. Um, landlord tenant, um, uh, future interests in estates law, all kinds of stuff there, um, uh, and servitudes and various easements, that kind of stuff. Um, also land use, zoning, and takings law. So there's some, some Supreme Court doctrine in there too. Um, so anyway, um, but what's really interesting to me about uh, property is the concept of property. So one of the main things we talk about a lot in, um, in property is what, it, what is it? What's property? How do, you, how do you figure out who owns it? How do you figure out what you own? What, uh, what does it mean to have property rights, right? Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about that. In this case, Pearson versus Post is a case about uh, those questions, those questions. Um, have you all read it or looked at it or glanced at it? Doesn't matter. It's a case about a fox, right? <laughs> this is absurd. The case is making fun of us. I just want to be clear about this. Not the majority opinion. The majority opinion is very serious and has a lot of Latin in it. The, the, the dissenting judge, though, is making fun of the reader. I want you to be clear about that. It's supposed to be funny. It's law humor, so it's not, <laughs> it's not, that, it's not that funny. So, um, so uh, um, but this is what, what they call in the business an old chestnut, right? The a case you start with. Lots of property classes will have this in whatever law school you're in. Um, uh, probably all of them. Most of the case books seem to have this case. It's a case about possession. Possession giving rise to a property right. And defining what possession is, right? That's what this is. And in all my classes, I'll start, I start the same way, and that is we draw pictures on the board. So here's what I want you to do for me. I'm going to go up to the board. I'm not very good at this. I don't use PowerPoints or any kind of technology. This thing is so weird. And you're going to tell me what's going on in the case, OK? You're just going to call out the facts of the case, OK? So uh, and I'll ask questions as we go. So where are we? I'm so far away from you. Yeah, Queens and New York, right? That's good. Yeah, so we're in New York State. Where are we? Is anybody from this part of the, part of the country? New York? Yeah, where, whereabouts? I live in Manhattan. Yeah, so do you know about Long Island? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've never been there, but you, there. you've heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try to stay away from Long Island. I have family in Queens and some family in, in Scarsdale. Like the, we drive a lot on the Belt Parkway, which is very pain, pain, painful. But anyway, so this is out. What town? Do we have a town? Do we even know? We might not know. Doesn't really say. It's a beach community out there, though. Whaling community is actually. It's, there's some interesting history of this case. But so here we are in New York. But where are we physically? Like, what's the space and who owns it? This is, turns out to be an important detail. That is, where's the fox being chased? This is really important, although maybe not so important. I don't remember the exact name, but like a barren wasteland. Yeah, like called the what? Like a they have a name for it. This is great. Does, does anybody see this? So we're just setting the scene. Barren wasteland called the. Do we have it? Waste and uninhabited ground. Yep, waste and uninhabited ground. Where is that? He's chasing it on waste and uninhabited ground. Anything else? Does it tell us anything else about this space? Yeah. 
Is it the beach? Is there a beach somewhere? Or is that not here? I don't know. Someone look. It's See if on the Wikipedia page that I read. It, it said the beach. Oh, so maybe it's from Wikipedia. It gets mixed up in my head. So I, only, I don't read the cases. I just look at them on Wikipedia. <laughs> anyway, waste and uninhabited. What is... So that's important. Why? This is my handwriting, so you can't read it. It's purposeful because I'm a very bad speller. So I just go like this and then something. Why is it important that it's waste and uninhabited? No one owns it. That's important because if somebody owned the land, then what would these, be, these Pearson and Post be doing on there? Trespassing. Yeah, you're already first year law students. You're already well advanced. They'd be trespassing, and then there'd be some complicated question about who owns the fox that's on somebody else's land, right? There'd be some complicated question. I don't want it to be complicated. Like, who owns that? Are you allowed to cross onto somebody else's land to get stuff? Not usually, but sometimes you might be able to. It gets a little complicated. But that, and this makes it easy. This is waste and uninhabited. Now, in fact, that land is probably owned by somebody. Well, I don't know. It might be owned by the town. Or maybe it's common property. Maybe by custom, everybody gets to be on the beach. Maybe it's a public trust. There's a doctrine in the United States where the, the, the shoreline, if you're on a, on a beach, there's some public trust lands. That is lands that are covered by water or will be covered by water by the tides. Those might be accessible to everyone. So that could be a form of common property. Not unowned exactly, but common. Uh, this could matter to us. Um, in terms of the fox, though, um, it doesn't matter that much because no one owns it, right? That's important. All right, so then who's chasing whom? Who's over here chasing? This is the chaser. Is that post? I get confused about the names because they're both P's. I'm going to trust you. All right, so post is here. And post is doing what? This becomes important too, unbelievably. No, doesn't kill anything yet. Post doesn't, right? What's, what's post doing? And what does post look like? This, I don't mean what is it like. Just your imagination of what post looks like. What is post doing? Chasing the fox. How? On a horse? I always put him on a horse. Is that just wrong? I put him on a horse every single year. For 22 years, I put him on a horse. Why? Because I imagine him on a horse. But is he on a horse? Not according to this, right? There's no mention of a horse. But there is mention, and that's sad for me, because I like drawing horses. <laughs> And this is how I draw them. And then I put post on the horse, <laughs> right? And I give him a hat and a red vest and various other accoutrements. And then I give him what? Hounds or dogs? This becomes really important too, strangely. Hounds. hounds. I don't know the difference between a hound and a dog. Maybe you do. But I draw the hounds like this. And they look like giant, like, turtle cats. <laughs> and I imagine dogs look like this. Just smaller versions of the hounds, right? Do we know how many hounds? Multiple. There's more than one. I don't know why it matters. It should matter. It does matter to one of these Latin dudes. It matters to them, apparently. I don't really get it. So now you've told me that the horse I've drawn for years is, disappears. That's OK. We'll just bring Post down here. And how long has he been chasing the fox? How long? Do we have any idea? Do we know how far he's chased the fox? Do we think he's been doing it for a long time? Here's the fox, by the way. Do 
don't laugh. You might have me for property and then I'll know you laughed at me. <laughs> it's sort of an alligator-ish thing. It's not that big. And then, so there's the fox being chased by Post, who's not on a horse, just to be clear. And who's over here? Now, how do you imagine Pearson? What is Pearson doing? Just standing on the beach? Does he have a gun? Does anybody have a gun? I think it implied that he did it from a distance. Yeah, there's some weird, I, it's hard to tell how the, how, anyway, Post is here, and I imagine him without a hat and hiding behind a rock, which is also a bush. Except it's a wasteland, and I think it's a beach, so that's probably not true. But maybe he's just standing there randomly. It's hard to tell. And then what happens? This is really important. He, does he kill the fox? We think from a distance maybe he kills the fox. There's some way that he grabs the fox. Now, kills the fox, it matters, because if he say, let's say he shot the fox, and then post grabbed the fox, we'd have some kind of hypothetical, right? Let's say he doesn't shoot the fox, but he gets close to the fox, right? Now we're doing movies. This is, imagine this is a movie. Now he gets close to the fox, but he hasn't quite grabbed him. Maybe he's captured him with a net, right? Does he have, Post has the fox in, in his hands? That might be what he's got. Let's assume that. And he carries him off. So there's Post, happy, with the fox, in a bag. I'm putting it in a bag. I don't know what else to do with it. I mean, Pearson, this is Pearson. And Pearson is, also has another name in the case. At least the descent calls him what? Saucy intruder. Yeah. Is that awesome or what? He's the saucy intruder. Okay. All right. So the saucy intruder post is gotten closer and is now quite sad. That's post is sad. And um, um, and are there any other facts that are helpful to us in this case? Is there any other important facts that we? might want to know something about. Okay. Yeah. Pearson takes him away, takes the fox away. Takes the fox away. So that's him with the bag, taking him, absconds with the fox. So that's important. He's not just standing out there, both of them. Any other facts? Uh, Post knows that Pearson's chasing him. Oh, does he? Pearson knows the Pearson knows? How does Pearson know? How do we know that he knows? Yeah, maybe it's, so Pearson with knowledge, this would be like with knowledge of Post, right? So he's, he's not just, he's not just a, a guy who happened upon a tired fox, is what you're saying. He's a guy who stole the fox. <laughs> now stole is a heavy word, that's the whole point of the case, right? Did he steal the fox or didn't he steal the fox? He's, would it make a difference if Post is, is chasing and Pearson didn't know and there's just a tired fox there and he grabs it? Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference to this court? No, it doesn't make a difference what his intent is. Maybe it should. What is a, a fo who owns a fox as it's running on the beach? Who owns it? Or let me put it this way. Who owns a fox when it's not being chased by anybody and just wandering around in the woods? No one. It's unowned. In Latin, it's ferri naturae. Ferri naturae. And what's the rule for ferri naturae? What's our property rule for ferri naturae? That is, how do you get ownership of something that's unowned in the wild? Some kind of labor or active? Well, so let's figure it out. So. Um, how do you get something that is unowned to be owned? Occupancy. Yeah, occupancy. 
That's a weird word, though, for a fox. Like, you can't occupy a fox. But that's, yeah, that's sort of what they say. So the general rule seems to be occupancy. Um, which is a kind of possession. Ownership by occupancy or possession. Now, there are a couple of things we want to we wanna be clear about. Um, we don't have to consider the fox unowned in the world, right? What else could we say about the fox? It could belong to the state. It could belong to the state. That's right. It could belong to the state. It could belong to all of us in public trust. Like, you can't take wild animals out. We, they belong to all of us. Who else could they belong to? The fox. It could be someone's fox. It could be someone's. Yeah. Then, we would, then we'd have a different story, right? Then someone would own it and be a dog or something like that, yeah. Right? We'd have a different story. Someone would own it. This is ferri naturae. What about the fox? Fox could own itself. We might say, hey, actually, these creatures, they have a right to do their thing. We don't really think that way, though we're starting to. We're starting to think that way when we think about um, animal rights. But not in this period and not now. We just think the ferri naturae is available to be taken by the first grabber, the first grabber, the rule of occupancy. Or we might call it the rule of capture. Right? Now, what is the rule of capture? What do you have to do to capture the fox according to the law? that is laid down by the majority opinion. What is the rule exactly? Do we have language for the rule exactly? What is the rule of capture? And, and, and does it work? Does it work? What is the, how do they describe the rule of capture? Do you have some language in the case? Yeah, corporal possession. There's a whole sentence there that says you, you, um, you get capture when the pursuer, well, this gets confusing. When they wound circumventor yeah, maybe they wound circumventor is here. There's Pufendorf. He's saying stuff. I don't know if we should trust him. I don't know who these guys are. <laughs> And then there's a bunch of Latin, and it's confusing. And he says, well, then here's the thing. Here's the thing Pufendorf says. Then here's why it's a little confusing. The actual bodily seizure is not indispensable to acquire a right to or possession of wild beasts. Right? What do you need to do? Intend to take it. Yeah, mortal wounding might be OK. Deprive it of its natural liberty brought him within certain control, manifest an unequivocal intention of expropriating the animal to his individual use, right? Now we have a three-part test. Oh, vey. I hate three-part tests, <laughs> right? We have a three-part test. Pursuit, the pursuer manifests an unequivocal intention of appropriating the animal's interest, has deprived him of his natural lady, and brought him, with him within his certain control. It's not so easy, it turns out. Well, and we know it's not so easy because we've already started to think about what post, let's say post way back when, the fox is over here, so it's hard to tell, just kind of clipped the poor fox's foot. And the fox is limping along, not moving quite as fast as the fox, moving a little fast, right? And then Pearson picks up the fox. Whose is it? Who said that? You're so certain? Well, Why? Because it says here that Puffendorf affirms that a wild beast mortally wounded or greatly maimed oh. cannot be intercepted. That, it just doesn't seem So right. greatly maimed becomes, yeah. So, this, so I gave you a hypothetical where he wasn't greatly maimed. How many legs do have to be hit to be greatly maimed? At least two. At least two. Nice. <laughs> That's a clear rule, too. 
At least two. Except if they're limping along and Post is way back there, then what? Yeah, he's still in pursuit. What about part three? Brought him within his certain control. That part's not so certain. And let me give you another example which will confuse us even further. What is this? It's a whale. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like a whale, but it's a whale. Now this is, a, that's not bad actually now that I look at it. Now, what's the rule for whales? Not today, but in the 19th century. A lot of whaling going on in this, in this very community. A lot of whaling going on, right? Off the coast of Long Island. In the whaling community, ships are spending weeks and weeks. And what is a whale? Like a fox, it's, in Latin, ferri naturae. Fabulous. Ferri naturae, first grabber gets it. First grabber, right? first grabber. So we've got the whale. Boats are spending enormous sums, the, right? Investors have invested in these whaling ships to come and get, those are ships, to come and get the whale. They're chasing the whale across the sea. Moby Dick, right? Across the sea. Months and months and months. Do they own the whale if they've chased it for months and months and months and tired it out? Not according to this rule. What if they lance the whale with a lance. I don't know what a lance is, but you know what I'm saying. Now what? The whale's still swimming along. Why is the whale still swimming along? Because a whale can survive for a long time with a lance in it. Not forever. Not forever. And so the lance goes in, the whale swims around for a while longer, and then washes up. on the beach with the lance in it. And the saucy intruder, <laughs> this is getting interesting, right? The saucy intruder comes along and claims the whale, Pearson. Right? It's a dead whale now. Whose whale is it? Does it depend on how lethal the lance was? Yeah, maybe. Like, but Right, under our rule, so let's take our three-part test. Remind me what it was, because I've already forgotten. Uh, unequivocal intention of appropriate. Intention to appropriate was the ships. Deprivation. Deprivation of natural liberty. The lance went in. It's not clear. The whale's still swimming around. What's the third? Certain, Certain control. They don't have control. They haven't grabbed it. It's sort of, right, until it washes up, right? So um, under that test, it's possible Pearson can get the whale too, right? Possible. It depends how right, lethal this is. If it, the problem is if it kills the whale, where does the whale end up? Often at the bottom of the sea. In fact, if you haven't brought it on board, right? You try to bring it on board. But then the whale might wash up. And then we still have this question, right, whose is it? And in fact, we might say, well, I don't know if we like this rule for whales. We'll ask about that in a minute. We're going to ask about whether we like this rule for whales. How about ducks? There's a little in in indication about a duck pond. Did you see that? Yeah. Now that should have, you should have been shaking your head on this one. Did you see the duck pond? That's weird. What is a duck pond? Anybody know? I don't know either. It doesn't matter. We'll make it up. I'll just draw a picture. Uh, with another board. No, I'll keep it on the same board so you can see all the fabulousness. That's a duck pond. What's in the duck pond? Duck decoy is <laughs> very important. Those are wooden fake ducks. That's pretty good, I think, actually. Better than my whale, for sure. What happens? I'm a duck. Ducks come in. I don't know why this works. <laughs> Do you know why it works? They see other ducks, and what is, the, what is happening there? Why does it work? You would go into the duck? Because you're a sociable person? So if there's somebody swimming around, you'd be like, oh, that pool looks safe. I think most people here would, too. 
jump right in. Because there was so maybe it's that the ducks are there, so the duck pond looks like a safe place. Is that how this works in the duck's head? Or they want to just be sociable and they're like, crap, you're not very talkative. Duck, you're not. So the du real ducks come in and hang out. And what does the court say about the duck pond? This is really, so the one thing I try to do is point out and have, when you guys are reading these cases, is figure out a magical moment in the case a little magical moment where the rule that they've stated suddenly doesn't look quite like the rule at all, right? Because suddenly they've created an exception that looks a little weird if the rule that they stated is actually considered the rule, right? What does it say about ducks? Just read the duck pond section. The ducks were in his pond. Well, read the actual language. Read the actual language. So, you know, that's because, guess what? Post cited some cases. This is fabulous. It turns out there's some duck pond cases in the, in the doctrine. There's some duck pond cases. That is awesome. Somebody's fighting over the duck ponds, right? And they're litigating over it. So there's some duck pond cases. And the duck pond cases hold what? Can you tell from what they, what? they dismiss it? But what does it say exactly? Just read it out, somebody. The ducks are in the painter's favorite pond, and so in the session. Yeah. Which is obvious the court. Yeah, keep going. That's the, that's the best part. From which is obvious the court laid much stress in their opinion upon the big session of ducks rational fully. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so someone explain this to me. On our three-part test, R remind us of the three-part test again. Just read it. I can't remember again. Um, unequivocal intention of appropriating the animal to yeah. use, yep. deprived of natural liberty. Deprived of natural liberty. Yeah. All right. So, um, just speak to me like I'm five. Are the ducks in the duck pond? Do they meet that test? No. Not the second two parts. They're free to go and come. They're just hanging out in the duck pond. This is magical. So it turns out, if you build a duck pond and you put duck decoys in it and ducks fly into it, guess what that turns into? Occupancy. Capture, right? It also turns out, if you lance a, a, a whale and it washes up, guess who gets the whale? The lancer gets the whale. Sometimes with a finder's fee to the finder. That seems to be occupancy, too, even though it's not under your certain control, right? There's another couple of cases we could talk about. A baseball hit from the stands. We talk about this case. It's called Popov versus Hayashi. So pitcher pitches the baseball. Who owns the baseball? Yeah, Major League Baseball, maybe. Maybe the team. It turns out the home team often owns the baseballs. They own it, and they give it to the players on the field, right? It's like the beach. Ball is pitched. Who owns it now? Yeah, still the home team or somebody. Then I, ball's hit. Who owns it now? Yeah. I field it. Well, I'm playing both roles. I field it, and it's a famous ball. It's a famous ball. Let's say it's the at last out of the World Series, and I'm the first <coughs> baseman, and I field that ball, and I step on first base and get the last out. And then I take the ball, and I put it in my pocket. And I run into the dugout, and we're cheering, and we're there. Why is that ball, ball valuable, by the way? Because it's the last out of the World Series, right? Pick your team, whatever team you want to imagine. What team do you like? Dodgers. Dodgers. OK, fine. <laughs> Dodgers are great. Mets, Yankees, not the national, uh, not the American League. That's not only National League team. Takes the ball, goes home with it, and says it's my ball. How much is that ball worth? Could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's the last out of the World Series. Who owns that ball? Well, MLB then sues them. Turns out, right? Now we have to figure out who owns the ball, but it's actually not so clear. But here's the, bit, the other point. Hit the ball. I'm Barry Bonds. It goes over into the stands. You guys are the stands. Who owns the ball? 
Well, I don't know. It's actually in the stadium. This is the stadium wall. So we're still in the stadium. Who owns the ball? Yeah. Now it falls straight down, still MLB. But as soon as it goes over the wall, who owns the ball? No. The first grabber. What is that baseball in Latin? Ferri natura, right? Right? Except it's not quite ferri natura because it was owned. The baseball was owned, and as it goes over the, over the wall, what does it become? Abandoned. 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 And what's the rule for abandoned property? Who gets it when you abandon property? Boom. It's going, going, going. Now abandoned over the stands. Who gets it? The first grabber. Right? That's the rule of the stands. That's the rule of the world, too. If I put something out on my curb and I'm treating it as tranche and intend, intend to, to get rid of it, the first person who comes along and possesses it gets that property. That's the rule, general rule of abandonment. In the stands, it's the same rule. Now, what happens in the stands, actually, as that ball is coming over, especially if it's a valuable ball? It's a bad scene, dude. <laughs> right? I went to baseball games at Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia, watched the Phillies. You're in those stands. You do not want to get in a fight with a Phillies fan <laughs> over the baseball. And I was a kid, right? I was a kid. I had my glove, I had my hat. Get the ball, the ball, right? Falls to the ground. Who grabs it? A very drunk, large man. <laughs> Grabs the ball. Holds it up. Why does he hold it up? This is important. To show, that to show that he has possessed it. Okay. So now we've got a couple of, we've got duck ponds, we've got whales, we've got foxes, we've got baseballs, right? We can do this all day. Oil we can do it with. Guess what else we can do it with? Information, news. We can do it with information, too. Who gets the information when it goes out on the newspaper? You know, I've never heard of a newspaper, but it's a thing with paper, and you read it. Who owns that? No one, apparently, except if it's copyrighted, blah, blah, blah. But the facts of the day, who owns those? No one. And guess what happens to newspapers because no one owns that, and they can't assert a property interest in, in it? Newspapers go out of business because all of you people take that information and you tweet it out or Instagram it out or TikTok it out. And then there's no purpose to having newspapers. Except then what happens? There's no news. There's no news. If there's no newspapers to go get the news, then there's no news. And we can work that back. So now we can talk about news, too. So that's information. Is information, is information unowned? Is it ferri natura? Is it like a whale? Is it like a fox? Is it like a duck? Is it like a baseball hidden to the stands, right? All these possibilities. So now we try to apply these rules to these separate things and, um, and then we get to the descent. Who's mocking us? He's not mocking us, he's mocking the majority opinion, right? He's making fun. Right? With the Latin. He's using Latin phrases that are nonsense. Do you see that? Subjove frigido. That's under a, a frozen moon. You're going out and you're just, right? He says all this saucy intruder, right? He's making fun. And what does he think the rule should be? What does he think the rule should be? The rule is capture, or at least some version of capture, although it's not quite clear if it's capture. It's got this three part feature. What does the dissent think the rule should be? Yeah, maybe imminent capture. Who should we ask about what the rules should be, according to the dissent? Sportsmen. 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 That is the social norms. Who's doing it? Just like the stands. We might ask the people in the stands what the social norms. So he says, he says, you should ask sportsmen what they think is the good practice, like what, what, what you guys are doing in the culture. What is it that you do when you're fighting a fox? And at the end of the day, um, the rule should be, um, 
should be a reasonableness rule. A reasonableness rule. If you have a reasonable prospect of capturing the fox. Now that's a standard. We have a distinction in law school between rules and standard. A rule is kind of a bright line rule. You have to be 35 or you have to be 18 to vote. I don't know what 35 is. To be president or something? Okay, so that's fine. 35. If you're not 35, you can't do it. That's a bright line rule. A standard is reasonableness. Act reasonably. These guys want a rule. The majority wants a rule. They want to say rule of capture. You know it when you see it. And the reason we want that is so that we don't have a lot of quarrels. Did you see that? We don't want to have a lot of quarrels, which is another way of saying we don't want to have a lot of litigation. They have litigation anyway, so this is a little weird. But OK, we don't want a lot of litigation. A standard is good because it lets you balance right, the various interests, right, and, be, and, and assess reasonableness. But it does invite folks to litigate over these kinds of things because the standard's not entirely clear. But also rules tend not to be entirely clear, too, after you push on them a little bit. That is, rules sometimes become standards quite quickly. And that's what we see when the court says, the rule is capture. You really have to grab it. And then they say, except with ducks. And probably not with whales. Right? And, and maybe not with right, some other thing. News, I don't know, information, right? It might, right, the rule might be good for the, for the fox only. That's not much of a rule, right, for other things and for, and for future. So then we've got to ask ourselves, well, what exactly, right? This is a, so we've got two competing rules. One is the rule of capture, which has this kind of three-part feature, and then a kind of rule of reasonable prospect or reasonable opportunity to get. And we should look at social norms. So then we might say, we might start to try to figure out, well, what exactly is the property rule trying to do? What is it trying to do? Why would we pick one rule over another, right? And foxes is just a silly example, but there's lots of right, information, pretty important, right? Other things pretty important. And we've got some theories. These are just mine, but they're also John Locke's, so that's cool, <laughs> right? Labor theories, John Locke. So it's, I, feel, I feel comfortable with it. One theory is you get property, a moral right to property, if you invest your labor in it. If you invest your labor in it. That's a way of, of obtaining property. We recognize property when you invest your labor in it. These guys have invested their labor in it. These guys have invested their labor in it. These guys have invested their labor in it, right? The news organizations, the newspapers have invested their labor in news, right? In gathering information. That may give you a moral right to property. Another theory of property we see a lot in, in, in uh, first year property is just possession. You've got it physically, all, all, all of you people. We assume the things you're wearing, your clothes, and the stuff in front of you is yours. We have no idea that it's yours, but we just assume it because possession is a nice, clean rule. You've got it. We're going to assume it's yours. And we're going to treat you it like yours until we're told otherwise, until there's some other evidence. So possession is a big thing. Possession here is the rule of capture. You've got the fox. We're done. Settled expectations. This is a third kind of theory of property or social norms. And that's what the dissent says. They say, hey, what did people expect the property to be, the property rule to be? What did the sportsmen expect the rule to be? What is the norm of the stands when the ball goes into the, into the stands? Who should get it? The first grabber, usually, even if there's a scuffle. Not the first toucher, right? It hit my glove, bounced off. No. That's not who gets it. That's not the rules of the stands. Settled expectations or social norms is another theory of property. Another one, a big one, social welfare. And by social welfare, I just mean what's good, what kind of good things you want. You want to maximize the good things and minimize the bad things. Whatever those things are for you. We're not going to tell you what they are. You get to decide that later. But in a social welfare calculus, what do we want to do to the fox? We want to kill the fox. Not today, we're very, we like foxes. But in those days, the fox is what, according to the dissent, remember? An enemy of humanity, an enemy of humanity. Foxes are bad, they, they steal chickens, they do all, right, all this stuff. 
they're bad. So we want more foxes killed than not killed. Let's assume that's our social welfare goal. How will you do that? Who should you give the property right to to kill more foxes? Maybe. But remember, if Post gets his fox stolen, will fo Post chase foxes anymore? No, won't invest time and energy to chasing foxes anymore, right? Maybe we want to reward useful labor. Reward useful labor. If you reward useful labor like chasing a whale, because we want to kill whales, that's not what we want to do anymore, but we did. You want to reward the ship that went all across the sea, tired the whale out, and not just the guy who came up at the last minute. Maybe you want to reward the newspapers that collect all the news, spend millions of dollars to collect all the news, and give them an ownership interest in it, not the person who just comes up and steals the information, steals, quote, and distributes it, right? So you might worry that you want to give the property right to the, to the actor that is doing useful labor on a social welfare calculus, depending on what that is. But you can make the opposite argument, which is, hey, Post really sucks at catching foxes. <laughs> Took him so long. Pearson's a lot better at it, right? That's just a disruptive technology. Pearson's just a disruptor. And that's what the internet people will say. They'll say, newspapers just suck at doing this. We just need a new business model. And we're better at it. And yes, there'll be a transition and all this stuff, but we'll be better at it. So social welfare is a cost benefit. Who do you give the property right to get the thing you want and not get the thing you don't want? So for example, the ball goes into the stands. What do you want to happen? You don't want people to fight over it, right? Because maybe people get injured. How do you reduce injuries? Who do you give the ball to? The first toucher? The person that grabs it from the ground? I don't know. We'd have to decide. Rights, rights, property rights. A rights claim, though, in this instance is um, we have a sense that your property is yours even if somebody can use it better than you can. Even if social welfare, a social welfare calculus would say you should, you should have somebody else use it and have it. A rights claim is no, you don't get to do a cost benefits uh, analysis on my stuff, right? It's just a right. It's a human right, or a dignitary right, or a privacy right, or an autonomy right to have property, to have something. Even if somebody can use it better in the social welfare sense. Even if somebody can use it better in a social welfare sense. That's how we often think of property, as a right. And then there's distributive justice. What do we know about Post and Pearson? Is somebody rich and somebody poor? Does Pearson, did Pearson take the fox because he has to feed his family? Do we have any idea? No, because the law is often, often blind to those kinds of distributive justice considerations. But distributive justice is at the center of property rights. At the center. So you have to think, maybe the law should think about, hey, who's got more stuff and who's got less stuff? And is that a fair distribution in society? We now enforce property rights despite the distribution in society today, right? We enforce them even if somebody has a gadrillion dollars versus somebody with zero dollars. You know, zero, the person with zero dollars doesn't get to take the money from the gadrillion dollar heir, gadrillion non-heir, right? or the land, or et cetera, even if they need a home, even if they need a place to sleep, even if they need the food, right? Maybe the law should, maybe the law should take that into account, and maybe we should have taken it into account here when we do um, the law of capture. All right, we're out of time. Thank you.